Now, uh, Kevin mentioned this morning when I first asked my professor at Indiana University about going into the addictions field and studying alcohol. There's a lot of drinking problems in my family over the years. And it was in the origins of the behavioral therapy was first developing. So I was in graduate school in the mid-60s. And so they were looking at you know other kinds of behaviors like snake phobia and others from a behavioral therapy perspective. So I said, what about drinking behavior and addiction? He said, you don't want to go into that. It's a kind of a black hole. There's not much going on, and it's very interesting. You don't like working with these people. They don't pay you. All these kinds of things. So uh, around that time, I was looking at Brickman's model of helping and coping applied to addictive behaviors. And I think that you know when you look at these four different models that Brickman came up with, he was a social psychologist looking at attribution theory. You can see why there's so much controversy, and you all know this through my personal experience, about what addiction is and what's the best way to deal with it. So Brickman asked first, is, do you consider the person responsible for the development of the addictive behavior? Is it her fault or his fault that he or she is an alcoholic? And is the person along the top responsible or capable for changing the addictive behavior on their own? And Brickman came up with these four models, basically the moral model, which basically says, yes, it's your fault, you've committed a crime, if it's an illegal drug, you need to be punished, the war on drugs. Of course, we're now realizing this is not a very effective or helpful way of handling people with drug or alcohol problems. And we now have 2,300,000 people locked up in this country, which is more per capita than any other country in the history of the world. And we're dealing with, if you're an African-American male, one out of seven are in jail, one out of 20 Hispanics. And on most of these programs, except for some of them, are not really giving people treatment for alcohol and drug problems. They're being punished, basically. And when they're released, the recidivism rates are very high, as we're all aware. Now, fortunately, Kurlikowski, who was the chief of police in Seattle, by the way, before he became nominated as a drug czar, said in an interview with the Wall Street Journal just like a month and a half ago, the war on drugs is going to end. We're not going to be keeping locking people up for these kinds of problems. We're going to try and get them help. We're trying to get them treatment. And Tom McClellan, was, I just talked to him on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and he said, one of the first things they're going to do is train primary health care physicians at hospitals to be able to assess for co-occurring disorders, no matter what the medical problem is that the person brings in, are there drug problems, in that sense, smoking or alcohol or other kinds of drug problems, and if so, doing a brief intervention with them so that they get some idea of what might be possible. And that's been done in trauma centers recently, that uh, people that go to the trauma center, if they're there for car crash or something that involves alcohol, they are getting brief interventions now, and therapists are being trained to do that. And trauma centers are now saying, unless you have a brief intervention program, you can't get licensed as a trauma center. So I think we're going to see big changes in terms of who gets to see these kinds of folks first. Given, as we know, that you know, out of every 10 people with an addiction problem, nine of them aren't getting any help. You know, they don't, there's a lot of resistance, there's a lot of shame, blame, guilt. So how can we make things more user-friendly so that we can get people to come on board and uh, get them some, start to get them some help? And then, of course, the disease model, uh, Brickman put down on the bottom right, it's not your fault. It's due to factors having to do with heredity and physiology. And, uh, but it's also true that you can't really change it on your own. You need some form of treatment which could be either medical treatment or could be spiritual treatment. That's where Brickman put the 12-step programs. But they, uh, of course, also uh, believe in the disease model, but the way through it could be more of a spiritual pathway. The 12 steps could be combined with other kinds of uh, approaches, but uh, that could be the way that change can occur. And AA and 12 steps have helped thousands and thousands of people and the work that Kevin Griffin and others are doing trying to integrate the 12-step program in the Buddhist uh, work, I think is very fascinating and interesting. Uh, but we also know that other people are looking for a spiritual approach and maybe the 12 steps isn't the right one for them in some ways. So from a consumer choice perspective, uh, mindfulness, given that it comes more from an Eastern spiritual approach, uh, might be an alternative. 
And they certainly could be combined uh, or maybe just seen as two different uh, pathways for people to make a change. And relapse there is often talked about loss of control of the higher power, you're missing meetings and so forth, so you're making yourself more vulnerable as you get back to the program. And then Brickman had the uh, last model, he called it the compensatory model. That's mainly where the cognitive behavioral approaches often come from. And for, he's basically saying you've got a problem, you need to learn what you can do to compensate for this in terms of getting it over, learning new skills. So it's a more of a learning based model. Uh, the addiction is also, in addition to biological risk factors like family history, You've also got cognitive factors like positive outcome expectancies. I think drinking is the only way that will help you get relaxed or whatever it happens to be. Self-efficacy, the degree of confidence that you have, that you can get through situations without falling off the wagon. Attributions about relapse, like when Oprah was originally talking about why she fell off the wagon, she was saying it was biological, it was due to factors beyond my control. I couldn't do it. I failed. So we call that the absence violation effect. The people, once they have their first use of the substance, they blame themselves, they feel it's due to factors beyond control, beyond their control, and they often give up. So how to work with people when they have had a lapse to try and get them to take a different look at it, what could they do differently the next time that could be more successful to cope, uh, would be an effective compensatory approach. So relapse there in the learning model is more viewed as a mistake, an error, you know, it's sort of like learning any new skill. Uh, you make mistakes, but we can learn from our mistakes. And it could be a temporary setback rather than a total black and white reaction. So when I'm dealing with people coming in to see me about alcohol or drug problems, I try to find out where he or she is coming from in terms of these models. Is it a good model or is it a model that's not working very well? And many of them don't know about the other approaches. And so there seems to be a shift in the field going on now that I can see away from treatment matching, where the provider says, here's the best kind of treatment for you, uh, to a more of a consumer choice model. You know, just different kinds of approaches here. Why don't you take a look and see which one might uh, appeal to you? So a lot of people, I give them a copy of Ann Fletcher's book, Sober for Good in which she interviewed hundreds of people that recovered from alcohol problems for at least five years, how they did it. And everybody did it in different ways. I mean, a lot of them were the 12-step programs, et cetera, but some people just went on their own. Something happened, it was their, they got a DUI, or it was their birthday, or, you know, these kinds of life events. So usually people will say to me after looking through there, hey, you know, there's somebody, smart recovery, I never heard about that, self-management and recovery training. I read about that in chapter eight, that's what I want to try. So I give them the chance, you know, here, try that, and, but you should have a backup. If that doesn't work, what else can you try? Because it doesn't seem that any one treatment works better than any other at this point. Different treatments work differently for different people. The more people stay in there, and even if they're backsliding and having problems, uh, the better the chances are of potential success. So I think that's uh, what we're trying to do is make, uh, make sure that people know about these different alternatives. So what I did when I got my PhD, I went on my internship uh, at Napa State Hospital in California here. And I was working in the alcoholism treatment unit. I told the story before, so if you've heard it, I'm here again. <laughs> and uh, anyway, my supervisor was an insight-oriented therapist. And he said, look, your job is to try and work with the alcoholic patients to find out if you could get them to understand why they had become an alcoholic, why they should stop drinking, why they should pursue a recovery path of abstinence, and so forth. So this one guy, he was very open to understanding why he had become an alcoholic. It had something to do, he thought, with situations with his mother, conflicts that they were having, and why he should stop drinking. His marriage was on the rocks. He was running out of money, work, things like this. And why he should maintain abstinence. So by the time he left the 30-day program at Napa, he got on the bus, I said goodbye to him, the Greyhound bus, taking him back to San Francisco, where he's from. And I thought, well, God, he seems highly motivated, and maybe this is, it's working for him. Uh, unfortunately, four days later, he was readmitted to the hospital, totally intoxicated, I'd go to detox for a while. And when I could finally talk to him about it, and I said, 
what happened there? You seemed like you were really motivated and you understood why you were an alcoholic. He said, yeah, you told me like why I should stop drinking. Well, I said, what happened? And he said, well, the Greyhound bus stopped in the Tenderloin district and right in front of the bar that I used to go to all the time. And I thought, you know, I wonder if my friend George is in there. And I'm just going to get off the bus and went right into the bar. George wasn't there. But the bartender recognized him, poured him a double, and he said, I took it, I thought I'd just have one, but then I wanted another one. And he said, you were very good at helping me understand why I shouldn't drink and why I shouldn't make abstinence. But he, he said, you never said a goddamn thing about how I was supposed to do it. And that the whole sort of, when he said that to me, my mind goes, right. Because, you know, I knew that the relapse rates were very high, people were readmitted a lot. I went to talk to the director of the alcoholism training program and I said, given relapse is happening so much, why don't we talk about it more and prepare people for the possibility? He said, no way. We can't do that. We don't want to talk about relapse because if we do, it gives people permission to do it. So we really want to focus more on uh, positive recovery. But it just made me think like, hmm, why aren't people doing more about relapse uh, issues? So then I went to the University of Wisconsin. I had my first faculty job there. And behavioral therapy was saying, we found a way that's helpful to get people to abstain and not relapse. I go, well, what is this? And they go, aversion therapy. So I thought, I'd heard about the Schick Shadell aversion program in Seattle, which is still in existence, been there since the 40s. But they were saying electrical aversion could be very helpful. It's all based on classical conditioning. If you present the alcoholic with a drink and then you shock them or you give them something that makes them nauseous, you develop a condition of aversion and they won't ever want to drink again. The relapse rates would go way down. So I got a grant from the government to do a study of electrical aversion therapy. I did it at Mendota State Hospital in uh, Madison, that's the alcohol treatment center. And uh, they let me build, buy, I mean, build a little bar downstairs <laughs> where we could do the aversion therapy. This is not a patient, but a fellow, a former student, Matthew, sort of demonstrating what's going on. So we brought them down there three times a week for the four weeks that they were there, presented them with drinks that they claimed were their favorite drinks before they came into the hospital. It could be whiskey or gin or beer or wine. To top, pick the top three and just brought them around so that the person could, we said, we want you to look at the drink as if you were about to take a drink and bring it up and sniff it, but don't actually drink it, we told them, because then the shock is going to go on. And we had different conditions, like if people said, no, I don't drink, the shock would go off right away. In some cases, it would stay on a little longer. These little technical differences. <laughs> and first we had the, uh, where the, the person's hand that was holding the drink is where we put the shock on, but too many broken glasses. <laughs> so we switched it to the other hand. I hardly believe I was doing those things in those days. People said, have you seen Marlatt's uh, laboratory? They called it Marlatt's bar and grill. <laughs> so anyway, what we found was when we looked at patients that went through the uh, aversion therapy compared to those that didn't, this was a randomized control trial, we found that three months after they got out of the hospital, they were drinking significantly less and had slightly higher abstinence rates than the people that just got the regular program, which is a disease model kind of traditional program, Hazelton kind of model. So that looked really good. So I thought, huh, it's actually working. But then we followed them up for another year later, and their relapse rates went way up. In fact, they were much higher significantly than the people that didn't get the aversion. So it kind of like pushed it down, and then it sprung back up. And when I read the punishment literature in psychology, they said, no, that's what's going to happen. You can suppress the behavior through punishment or aversion, but unless you teach people alternative or animals alternative coping skills, it's not going to last. It's going to rebound unless they continue to have aversion over and over, which they don't. So that's what got us into thinking, where can we teach these alternative coping skills? 